to our lecture on Thomas Hobbes. He lived from 1588 to 1679. You might recognize that first date. Apparently he uh, was born uh, because, at the time he was, because his mother was under the um, profound anxiety caused by the Spanish Armada's um, impending advent in 1588. So he was born with this fear um, surrounding him. He was the son of a vicar. Uh, he was sent to Oxford to study, but he reacted uh, against the Aristotelian scholasticism of the time, which was still regnant in the universities. He would, to, to link him to another thinker we've already treated, he was the recording secretary or amanuensis to Francis Bacon. He did end up visiting Galileo, so he was very much in the thick of these um, intellectual trends that defined the 17th century. So we'll treat Spinoza next, but this is the age of rationalism, and it is the time when that hold of Aristotle is being uh, loosened and a different, more modern mindset is coming into play. Hobbes is as influential a political theory as we get. Uh, he introduces, for all intents and purposes, this notion of the state of nature, which we'll get to. The question he asks, so we'll ask it here, what are we willing to sacrifice or tolerate to avoid threats to our safety? Now, he was writing in a time of great uh, distress, a lot of warfare, and that's his, his desire to see order maintained is what is behind his political theory. He was a great scholar of Greek. He translated the Pel on the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides, and towards the end of his life, he even translated the Iliad and the Odyssey. He is a very strange thinker in the whole course of the Great Conversation, the first one really to show us a, some, a system we could plausibly call atheist, though he denied being an atheist. He was a thoroughgoing materialist, and in that mechanistic mode that was in vogue, that is, you looked at even the human body in terms of pumps and, and, and tubes and all of that as opposed to something organic. That is, this is a mechanistic materialist, thoroughgoing, and therefore he's a determinist. He thinks that we have the desires we have because of prior cause of cause, and there isn't um, any real free will. These are hard to reconcile with a belief in divinity but we'll take him at his word. It is the tendency of his system to be atheistic, though. So that is a novum in the history of thought. There aren't a lot of atheists, and certainly not in the great and revered thinkers. Now, he's not revered. He's the, he's the punching bag. He's the one that everybody wants to uh, steer clear of on, on all sides, basically. Locke will present a theory of the social contract that is much more gentle and will, in fact, have a great effect on say, the American Revolution. So the uh, background here. The wars that he's dealing with, especially the English Civil War, have, or have their roots in the English Reformation. I put that in quotes because of all of the politically motivated um, revolts against the Catholic Church, this one is pretty crass. Uh, King Henry VIII is the second in the Tudor dynasty. The Tudors had taken over after the Brutal Wars of the Roses, the fought between the cadet branches of the uh, House Plantagenet, the Lancaster and York families from 1455 to eight, uh, 1487. This was itself the result of the, the great dislocations caused by the Hundred Years' Wars. So we've talked about this in previous semester, in the last semester. So the new house, the ruling family, is not securely established. It's <clears throat> Henry VIII is there. He is he was betrothed to the widow of his brother Arthur, so we almost had a King Arthur uh, for real there, uh, but Arthur died. So the widow was betrothed to Henry VIII. They married Catherine of Aragon. This lady was the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, a very important couple in, in a lot of what we talk about this semester. They're the ones who achieve the uh, ultimate reconquest, quote unquote, of, of the Iberian, well, of Spain uh, from the, the um, Muslims. And they set off, of course, the, 
the great expedition of, of Columbus to the New World. It's an important alliance to have their daughter be married to the king of England. This, this has to do with the power politics where England and France are still at each other's throats. Francis I is trying to establish an absolute monarchy in France. Okay, so that's their... Um, Catherine is also the aunt of the Emperor Charles V, a very important person. So this is going to be tricky because Henry VIII is now worried because of this dynastic insecurity. Catherine has not given him a male heir. He's got a mistress, Anne Boleyn. Uh, he had already got a dispensation to... The family had to seek a dispensation to get the marriage to Catherine in the first place because, of course, it's not... Or at the time, it certainly wasn't standard to allow one to marry your brother's widow. I think John the Baptist had something to say about that, too. So it, so it was... <clears throat> Henry VIII thought, well, I'm going to send my minister, Carl, Cardinal Wolsey, to, to the Pope and just get this thing undone, and then I'll be able to marry a woman and who will hopefully give me a male heir. It doesn't work out, though, because the Pope, who was the second Medici Pope, Pope Clement VII, he was in league with the French against Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. And that old um, conflict between Pope and Empire was still going on. And the sack of Rome happens under Charles V. His Protestant armies, ironically, even though he was a Catholic uh, ruler, they sack brutally Rome. And this is just one of the horrible things that happens to, to Rome. Clement is... And not a free man after that. So um, when Wolsey asks the Pope to give this annulment to, between uh, Henry VIII and Catherine, Charles V says, you are not granting this annulment um, that would set my aunt aside. So it doesn't happen. Henry VIII then sets in motion the, um, the series of events that makes him the head of the English national church so that's the anglican church in the end so that's that's the, the the background besides all that of course this is a dramatic time the 1500s besides the protestant reformation luther and then the next generation calvin and then all of the vociferous um, uh, forms that protestantism takes after that that's going on the emperor charles v has to deal with that because it's in his lands the german lands are of course the the heart of the uh, holy roman empire He's dealing with that very desperately. He's also, because he's the ruler of Central Europe, having to deal with the, uh, the great power of the Ottoman Turks, who are seemingly unstoppable. They, they brought down the, uh, the, the remaining Roman Empire in Constantinople, and Suleiman is pressing hard on him. So that's all in the background here. Henry uh, forms his church eventually after... His Catholic daughter Mary has her turn, and it's just a very sad story. Of course, Queen Elizabeth takes over. That's getting us into the 17th century. Uh, the wars of religion kind of get off to a fitful start in the 1500s. There's a tension, uh, a balance that's maintained after the peace of um, Augsburg, I believe. And that's... but. The emergence of Calvinism, which wasn't taken into account in that piece in the in the 1500s, is is a destabilizing factor. These German princes, remember, there's there's um, hundreds of them. They're uneasily related to their emperor, it's Charles V here, um, and they're trying to find a way to get leverage, and that's one of the reasons many of the German princes opt. Uh, they opt for either Lutheranism or Calvinism. There are political reasons, even if there may be, even, in fact, um, personal religious reasons. And, of course, they get to take over the property. So that's what Henry VIII does. He, did, he uh, just he expropriates the monasteries, takes all the, the wealth from the churches, and so on. Well, the German princes are doing, some of them are doing the same thing. This, the lid blows off in 1618. That's the beginning of the Thirty Years' War. I won't go into the details, but it is a truly devastating conflict. And, I mean, it gets overplayed maybe when we talk about how modern nation states are secular because of the wars of religion. Well, there's a lot to it, though. The Thirty Years' War um, entailed so much devastation. In some parts of the German lands, half the population was wiped out. You have 
Wallenstein with his marauding way of supporting his army and so on. Um, the counterattacks from Sweden and it's just, it's horrendous. It's anybody who has a heart would know, for the peasants especially, um, these wars were horrible. Now, it wasn't just religion, as I've said. These, these um, Protestant and Catholic conflicts have political uh, dynamism behind them. For Hobbes himself, more directly, because that 30 years war is on the continent, it's the English Civil War, quote unquote, between 1642 and 1651. This is part of a larger set of the wars of the three kingdoms. It's, it's a very messy time in English history during the English Civil War. So the background here is Elizabeth dies. She doesn't have an heir, of course. Uh, so this is her cousin, uh, James of Scotland. The beginning of the Stuart dynasty is brought in. He in his own person unites the crowns of Scotland and England. He in Scotland got used to running things without much of a parliamentary, uh, without much parliamentary uh, interference. So he has these notions that are beginning to show up everywhere of, of a kind of absolute monarchy. But he was a little more easygoing than his son will be. So um, that's okay. Parliament though is, is beginning to feel, the English parliament is beginning to feel, well, we might have to check the pretensions as a monarch again, going back to the tradition of, of Magna Carta of 1215. All right, so we're, we're citing that uh, precedent. During the English Civil War, uh, you have what Hobbes will late, later say, this was a result of Puritan fundamentalists, papal supremacists, and divine right Episcopalians. You have at least three parties. You have the, um, the royalists who support Charles I, who's the one who takes over after James um, is, it dies. And then he eventually is executed. So there's this regicide, which is, is truly shocking, I think, to the conscience of, of Europe. You have Presbyterians, who are eventually the ones who most uh, are in charge of the parliament. And then you have independents, and they're the ones that are the most radical Puritans, and they make up the new model army of Oliver Cromwell. Anybody who has Irish sympathies knows they hate this man. He's not a good guy, but he sets up the, he's the Lord Protector of England, or these kingdoms, in, uh, and runs it from 1653 to 1658, and then his son takes over. The son of Charles I, the executed king, is Charles, is crowned Charles II in, in 1660, and that's the uh, restoration. Hobbes is the tutor of the future Charles II during the Civil War. He writes the Leviathan during the Civil War and presents Leviathan to the future king in 1651. So that's, that's historical background. He is seeing the immense disorder caused by these rival ultimate claims about what parliamentary power versus the king and uh, religious disputes. We do have to keep in mind though that that power dynamic, which after the restoration, it is the case that the king can only rule by the consent of parliament. And then of course, the glorious revolution of 1688 changes the, uh, the whole landscape. This is more and more a shift to parliamentary government. So what is Hobbes trying to do? He's trying to give us a science of politics. This is the age of rationalism, a time when people are excited by the possibilities of new ways of thinking and what they can yield, even applying. So what you have with Hobbes is kind of um, maybe, well, one of the first sociologies, right? He wants to give us, according to the geometric method, that is, he's going to give us a set of definitions in Le Leviathan and then deduce a whole system from those definitions. Now, he's stacking the deck. He says voluntary action, which really I have to put in quotes because he doesn't really believe in free action. but Voluntary action, for instance, is to any uh, time we, if it's voluntary, I'm going for, I'm desiring, I'm going to try to attain the thing that looks good to me. The thing that looks good to me, based on its determinism, is something that has been kind of programmed, as it were, into me. But that's, that's a way of trying to understand that one thing leads to another. If you understand voluntary action as the pursuit of the thing that looks good to you, then you understand that thing that looks good is what above all self-preservation uh, how do you keep your life 
secure. Well, and that's that's where we're off to the races. He introduces this notion of the state of nature, which is not for Hobbes in the first place, this notion of a uh, an actual historical condition. He's just saying what he looks around during the Civil War and says, if there is no governmental authority that can maintain order, you've got the state of nature. It's where you are not secure in your person or in your goods. And in that uh, famous phrase, right? It's the war of all against all, where the more powerful, or at least those who can combine and more powerful associations can despoil those who are less powerful as they see fit. And in fact, he says there's kind of a natural right to this. So he's, he's going to use, even though it's not a divine legislator, he's going to talk about natural law, where now we're shifting to nature being not the intelligibility proceeding from God, but in fact, this um, mechanistic system. And in this mechanistic system, the, the strong do what they want. They have the right to it. They can rape and they can take and they can kill as they can. It's the war of all against all. And according to Hobbes, of course, this life would be solitary, uh, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So if we're in this condition, we know that there's a natural law to preserve our own life. That's going to be the first thing from modern political thought is that the first Natural law injunction is preserve your life, seek peace. Because there's this war where any, the, the mighty can take what they want, and here you can think back to Thucydides in, the, in that great dialogue where you have you know, the strong do what they will and the, the weak suffer as they must. So you've got this um, condition that must be remedied by a social contract. So he's really going to put this forward, and it's it is the basis of modern political theory to think in terms of a compact that to think of government as being rooted in a compact amongst uh, political actors. We know there's a hidden anthropology in this social contract. It really is the white male bourgeois actor. Um, it's someone who's, who's able to have, make those kinds of calculations and has those kinds of interests. And that's, that's definitely in, baked into the, what is supposedly a, um, a neutral framework. Okay, the social contract of the, the free male is something that would result, according to Hobbes, if you're thinking rationally, it would result in the formation of Leviathan. That is, you need to alienate your own natural right to take and rape and do whatever you and kill as you'd like. You would give that natural right up to follow the first natural law, which is to preserve your life, to have security for your life. We would all do this, and we would then alienate our uh, personal right to take and give it to a central authority. This Leviathan has to have absolute authority or else you're back in the condition of the state of nature. So this is his solution. It's, again, you've got the, the, the terrestrial God, as he puts it. So there's, there's the resonance of atheism. You, you don't have a, a divine horizon here. And it is a new political theology. He hates, he hates the Catholic Church. He hates all of the people who get worked up about religious dogma and for reasons that are clear for anybody who doesn't like killing, but he, he also, um, he isn't being, I think, completely honest, because in fact, he's giving us a new political theology. And it's, it's one that's inevitable. It's kind of baked in, I think, with Luther's collapsing of church and state into one power. Again, if you don't have a diarchy, where church and state have to jockey for each other, then in fact, you've got, um, you've got all power and authority kind of being telescoped into the modern nation state. And that's, that's what we see getting born in the pages of Hobbes, is the absolute sovereignty of the modern nation state. To use Weber's definition of that state, of the nation, it is that which has monopoly of the legitimate use of force over a territory. And that, that's, that is what we've got. That defines nations as we've got them. It is Habesian. 
It is the reason, even if we all love to hate him. Um, and it's been pointed out, of course, to have this kind of order, and there, there's another question, is what does it mean to have true order? But if we have at least peace, that's good for commerce, it's good for the new bourgeois order, it's good for possessive individualism, again, that, that hidden uh, bourgeois subject that's there in the uh, masked by the um, social contract. All right, so that's, that's what we get with Hobbes. It's absolutely essential for us to read him and take him seriously. He's a very powerful thinker. He's a very entertaining writer. And for better or worse, this, if we're going to try to grapple with the nations that, in fact, structure our lives, we've got to understand this theater, theoretician who has more than any other um, given us the political theology behind that state. And we go back to that question to end. I mean, it, it's easy for us when we ha are used to not enduring civil war to maybe think, well, for one reason or another, maybe we should burn the system down. But it is no good thing to endure civil war. And the question is, what should we tolerate in each other um, in order to have peace? And what can we not, what must we not tolerate? I think it's something we should just take seriously with Hobbes, that peace is an absolute good, even if we also recognize, and this is the part I think he's weak on, you have to defend the powerless when the powerful are being rapacious. And if that means some kind of use of force against their force, how can we turn this to good effect? And this is, all feeds into the questions of policing now and just war, of course. I'm not going to prejudge the issue. I'm just saying we should keep in mind that the powerless need to be protected and also that peace is an incomparable good. Mm -hmm.